gained expertise over uh, inscriptions of Tamil Brahmi. And he wrote a book which is now considered to be a classic book, which is called The Corpus of Tamil Brahmi Inscriptions, originally written in 1966, subsequently revised, uh, which is today considered to be a very, very major and an important work on Tamil Brahmi inscriptions. He also studied the Indus, Indus script and wrote the book, The Indus Script, Texts, Concordance and Tables in 1977. Uh, it is said to be the only available corpus of the Indian Indus script that is available with us. He was awarded the Padma Shri in 2009. And in the same year, 2009-10, the government of Tamil Nadu recognized his uh, contribution to Indian history or historiography by awarding him the Tolkapir uh, Award. So it was with such a person of eminence that Bhaskar had a great uh, fortune to work with and also to learn a lot in terms of the uh, both the Tamil Brahmi script and the Indus script. The, our paths crossed, Bhaskar and uh, mine and a few other friends crossed uh, almost 15 years back uh, when we were working on water management and water governance. And we were looking at ancient scripts and looking at what was the water governance uh, in say the Sangam period because Tamil Nadu has uh, a very unique uh, uh, water barrage which was created in the second century AD, uh, which is still working and which is one of the biggest wonders in terms of water governance and water management. So our paths crossed at that time uh, while looking out for what was there in ancient uh, literature in terms of water governance practices. And ever since then it has strengthened over the last uh, 15 years. Baska is also an expert in temple murals. And he introduced me and several of my friends also to the study of temple murals. Uh, way back, about 15, 20 years back, he was part of a larger team uh, which had photographed temple murals in the, in the state. Many of you may know, but many of you will not know, especially people from outside Tamil Nadu, that uh, our government in its great wisdom has gone and whitewashed many of the murals of great value. Bhaskar had used a variety of high technique uh, photographic material to photograph the murals and very painstakingly using a uh, electronic stylus, he had recreated the, uh, the, the, the prints of the murals. And he has a large uh, volume of many of these murals, probably the only person to have it in di digital form. Uh, in a very major conference, uh, a major meeting that we had organized at IIT Madras, he displayed uh, many of these murals that had been re uh, uh, recovered uh, in the form of huge Kalamkari prints. That is also when we also got, apart from uh, literature, we also got to know about the temple murals with him. We've gone on several visits to temples with him. And it's a fascinating trip to not only know about the history, but also to understand the, arch the, the architecture, the script, as also the murals in these various temples. Uh, Bhaskar is also the founder CEO of, uh, of Enterpub, uh, 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 an E uh, program, uh, which we are using in uh, our Barefoot Governance uh, program, uh, which has been extremely useful. Uh, during one of his uh, lectures to the students of our governance course at the Tata Institute of Social Science two years back, uh, suddenly he went off the script from talking in terms of how do we document and how do we work on uh, programs, uh, assignments and program, and started talking about uh, Indus Valley script and the history of that period. That's when we came to know it as a fascinating three and a half hour extempore presentation uh, on the Indus Valley uh, script, on the history behind it and its relevance to today. We are all living in times uh, where you have history and then you have fake history and then you have fake, fake history that's being promoted and pushed around for various reasons. At this point in time, it becomes very important to at least go back to the basics and to understand what, uh, what, what is the history behind the Indus Valley how do we understand these, uh, the scripts that are there? How do we understand the tablets that are there? How do we actually go back to fundamentals of deciphering history through the available evidence that the Indus Valley has provided? Uh, these are the discussions we have had with uh, Bhaskar over a long period of time. And many of our students have also had with him. And it is one of their pressures that said, sir, can you also present this to a wider audience? So it gives me great pleasure, friends, to introduce Bhaskar who in starting today, over the next five lectures, he will talk to us about uh, the various aspects of the Indus Valley script. I'll just take a moment to talk about uh, why are we calling it the Kudum lectures? It again links back with what uh, uh, Bhaskar has said and done 
and our interactions with him over the last 15 years. Uh, the word kudam is a Tamil word. It has uh, uh, equivalents in uh, North India, in East India, and indeed across all of Asia. We have traced it back to the Sangam period 2,500 years back, where Kudam was a place which was a meeting place of four roads, four big roads and people coming from four big roads. Kudam was a, uh, was a space in which people met. And the people who met did not necessarily belong to the same caste or community or have the same ideology or the same understanding of culture, history, etc. Kudam was a place where people of different faiths, of different languages, different experiences met and interacted with each other and arrived at certain understandings and certain consensus. But behind this was a construct, it was a social construct which recognized difference, which understood that societies are diverse and you cannot enforce a uniformity in diversity. What you will need to do is to allow and recognize and acknowledge diversity and difference. Do not treat conflict as uh, uh, unusual. They treated conflict as natural part of, of knowledge gathering and knowledge sharing. So the Kudam was a place which allowed for diversity, which understood difference, which treated conflict of opinion as normal and created a context by which people could relate with each other as equals where each voice was equal, where each opinion was something to be measured, was something to be treasured, was something to be valued and respected. So the Kudam was, in fact, the basis of Ashoka's Sangha. The Sangha is not just an assembly of people. It was an assembly of practitioners. So the practitioners had their own role at different points in time. So a doctor had a role when there was a need for health. There was a, uh, an engineer when you had to build the various... Uh, constructions that uh, Ashoka had, construct, had brought about, revenue people who would look at revenue and so on and so forth. So the Sangha was a, a group, was a place where people of different persuasions came and met and transacted and worked. The value of the Kudam was the value of consensus. And very importantly, and this is something that we all will need to know, especially in the troubled times we are living through in India, the consensus was not seen to be as the only way of coming to a resolution. They are ancestors recognized that it may not be possible to have a clear consensus at which point in time, the entire Kudam would, uh, uh, would agree to a certain basic minimum that all will respect. And whatever was decided was endorsed by everybody, which meant that when it was implemented, you did not have a police, you did not have an authority who will wield the danda against you to make sure that you followed the trip. This was the construct of the Kudam in ancient times. For the last 25 years, my colleagues and I, uh, Raghu Anantanarayan and Bhaskar and others, we have mulled with, with these various thoughts and have used it in life situations across India in our various uh, programs of governance reform in India. I have used the Kudam in three, three continents with people from about 30 to 40 countries and it resonates everywhere. It became a space where, irrespective of difference and conflict, people would come together, respect each other's voice, learn to talk with each other. That is why we felt that this space of learning and knowledge that we are creating through the Kudam lectures would be a place which respects this Kudam. And this Kudam is what is underlying much of our ancient history, much of our ancient culture, which luckily till now still survives. Maybe a little bit, but something that we need to take up and, and, and grow with. It, Kudam is called Chaupal in North India. It's called the Kutumba in Orissa. It's called the Kutumba. Uh, it's called the uh, Pancha in parts of Madhya Pradesh and other places. It's called in various names. But this construct existed all across the uh, all across Asia. In a big meeting in 2008, which Bhaskar had helped us uh, in terms of creating uh, very important uh, sessions in that period, we found people from Japan on the east going up to Arabia on the west who resonated with the notion of the Kudam and contributed over the next two years in terms of similar constructs in their various countries. So friends, uh, it gives me pleasure to introduce, to invite you all to the Kudam lectures. This is the second part of the Kudam lectures. We had a 10 part Kudam uh, constitutional law lectures uh, in June and July. Uh, this is the, const the Kudam lectures on ancient Indian history. We plan to have similar Kudam lectures on a variety of other subjects. We invite all of you to be part of this journey of the Kudam. Uh, our paths may cross. Sometimes we may not meet at other times. But together, if we can create a Kudam in India, 
that's a, a very, very important uh, thing that we can contribute to bring back peace and harmony to India. So it's over to you, Bhaskar. Uh, the, the last part is, this is a five part series. We, we start at six and we'll, it, it goes up to two hours. Uh, because of needs of technical uh, requirements and various other issues, uh, we have had a combination of Zoom and uh, YouTube. Friends who may want to send in your comments, please send your comments in the chat column in the YouTube uh, thing. Some of our uh, volunteers would be putting it together. And after Bhaskar's lecture, he will be answering the various questions that you have put up. Uh, additionally, if you have other questions over the next four lectures, please do feel free to send us your queries, your questions, your opinions, and other issues that you may want to clarify or get clarified in our uh, email, kudam.center at gmail.com. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, I also look forward, like many of you, to hearing Bhaskar now. So over to you, Bhaskar. Thank, thank you, Suresh. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And good evening, everybody uh, um, who's taken the time to be here. Um, I uh, have put together a very basic um, uh, material for Okay, uh, momentarily uh, uh, Zoom said I've been muted by the host. Uh, uh, thank you very much to unmute me. Uh, I, I hope everybody can uh, hear me. Uh, the audio is decent, I hope so. Uh, okay, so as I was saying, yes. uh, I, I have put together a very basic material for this particular session uh, in the understanding that there are four other sessions to cover and we can progressively dive deeper and deeper into the material at hand. Um, uh, the reason why I kept this particular session also very light is because I did not want to assume any kind of prior knowledge or prior ignorance on the part, on the part of the audience. So I wanted to be reasonably sure uh, that, that, that I have the chance to be on the same page with, with people who I have uh, 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 never interacted with before. Uh, uh, so therefore I kept, kept the material very, very basic. Uh, so I will start by sharing my screen. And please do confirm that you can see my screen. Yes, yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so our, our topic today is, is, is about the Indus Valley Civilization and, and, and not only today for the next four uh, sessions is on the Indus Valley Civilization. Um, and as I said, I wanted to essentially start with what uh, I did not want to assume any prior knowledge, but one thing that I was reasonably sure about is that people who are here today, the participants, the, the attendees uh, who are here today would have seen this poster in some form of, of the other, uh, either over mail or on WhatsApp or on social media or, or somewhere. Hello. Uh, can all the participants please mute your mics? I'll also be around to make sure, but just so that there are no interruptions, uh, please make sure your mics are on mute. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I proceed on the understanding that everybody who's here today would have seen uh, uh, this meme uh, uh, in some way or the other. Um, and therefore, I wanted to baseline it to this meme. Uh, and there are several elements in this meme, uh, any of which could have piqued your curiosity uh, uh, to want to come and spend uh, 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 time uh, on, the, on this. So let me start here. Uh, so... Um, there is the unicorn and then there is the script and then there is the city. Uh, so any of these three or probably all of these three would have been circulated to you by the Center for uh, um, a, a Law, Policy and Human Rights Center and its uh, um, uh, staff uh, who I must thank for Aishwarya and Abhijit for putting it together as much as uh, uh, I must uh, uh, thank Suresh. I, sorry, I forgot about that. So we will start here. Um, so in this Valley Civilization, 
uh, we titled this Indus Valley Civilization and not the Harappan Civilization or the Sindhu Saraswati Civilization. Uh, and you will usually come across material on the Indus Valley Civilization with any one of these terminologies used interchangeably to, in, interchangeably to mean the other. Uh, I, my own preference, as was Airavata Mahadevan's preference, is the Indus Valley Civilization. Uh, Harappan Civilization is, 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 is uh, favored by a lot of archaeologists. Um, and it's called the Harappan Civilization after the first discovery and after the first archaeological excavation that was conducted on the civilization. And, and therefore, very many people, uh, uh, especially archaeologists, uh, uh, like to call it the Harappan Civilization. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the longest ongoing archaeological project uh, uh, has a name, has a very beautiful name called Harp, uh, which uh, uh, expands to uh, Harappan Archaeological Research Project, uh, conducted by uh, conducted by Jonathan Mark Kenoya and, co and colleagues. Uh, uh, so Harappan uh, is is a frequent reference that you will come across, and there is a third reference which is the Sindhu Saraswati reference. Uh, the Sindhu Saraswati reference is favored by those um, who subscribe to the indigenous Aryan theory. Uh, they believe the Aryans are indigenous to India. And they believe uh, 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 that the Saraswati civilization should be so called because of the many references and many allusions to River Saraswati uh, in the in Vedic literature, uh, uh, which, however, no longer exists. Uh, but there have been many uh, uh, paleo studies, paleo geological studies uh, 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 recently, which have uh, mapped the Dead River and its course and its changing courses over millennia. And so uh, the Aryan indigenous or the out of India proponents uh, nice. like to use the uh, term Sindhu Saraswati. Um, so these are some of the terms that are frequently referred to. Uh, but as I said, my own preference and my mentor's preference is the Indus Valley Civilization. So that is how we will be uh, uh, referring to this as we go along. So that is as far as the title is concerned. What we do not know, why, why is, why should anybody come and spend time on, 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 on what we do not know? Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's doomed to failure right at the start, is it not? Uh, uh, to be coming and spending time on uh, nothing. Uh, uh, there is no new knowledge. There is nothing to gain. And, 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 but, but, but at the same time, why is it that what we do not know is, is probably uh, uh, um, an appropriate way to approach this topic? That is because uh, there is far too much presumption uh, uh, amongst scholars as well as non-scholars among laity uh, that they know uh, something about uh, the Harappan civilization. And there are macho claims about decipherment. In fact, the Indus script has the dub dubious reputation of being the most deciphered script in the world, though nobody really understands more than a few strings of characters um, on the Indus script. Uh, uh, and therefore, what we do not know seemed to me to be an appropriate choice of topic, an appropriate choice of title. Um, and what we do not know is also relevant in the, in, in the light of the absence of evidence, uh, which we need in order for us to know more about the Indus Valley civilization with certainty before we can go and claim things uh, uh, about uh, uh, our history and our past uh, as regards the Indus Valley civilization. Uh, it's, what we do not know is actually a very long list. It is much more than what we actually do know. We do not know anything about the religion of, of, of um, uh, the Indus Valley civilization. We do not even know what religion they had, if they had a religion or not. Uh, there must have been some religion, of course, but what, what form, uh, uh, what gods, uh, uh, what rituals, uh, what forms of worship, um, uh, we don't know. There is no lit literature on it. We don't know the polity. Uh, uh, the, the, there is reasonable consensus uh, uh, amongst, uh, in, 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 scholarly, uh, uh, in, in the scholarly community, uh, that there was no central ruler. There was no empire. There was no monarch. Uh, um, uh, uh, but was there a central doctrine uh, uh, um, which was then locally implemented and locally ruled. We don't know. We don't know the polity. 
uh, uh, or the social structure or the political structure of the Indus Valley civilization. Do we know the language? Everybody says he or she knows the language. Uh, and this is a very controversial topic. Uh, it has been made into a controversy more than it is the fact that it is innately controversial. It is innately mysterious, not controversial, but it has been turned into a controversy um, uh, and, and the controversy thrives. Um, we, we do not know with certainty the language of uh, the Indus Valley civilization. Um, there are many theories. We will visit these theories uh, uh, subsequently uh, later. And right now, as I said, merely, merely laying out the territory uh, to, to go deeper into uh, um, and uh, you know, gradually discover uh, each facet of this fascinating civilization as we go along. Um, we don't know almost anything about why or how uh, the Indus Valley civilization declined. There are many, many theories about uh, the decline and the fall uh, of the Indus Valley civilization, starting with natural calamity. Um, starting with the fact that the rivers changed course. Uh, um, uh, natural calamity, uh, uh, there is evidence that, you know, there were a few earthquakes in Indus Valley time in many regions of the Ind in Indus Valley. Rivers changed course. Of course, you study any river for 200 years, you can see that any river anywhere in the world will change course. Uh, uh, um, climate change, uh, 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 there have been many studies that claim climate change to be the cause of the decline of the Indus Valley civilization. Now, all of them may be true. Some of them may be true. Some of them may not be true. And the truth may actually be a combination of many of these. Uh, there may have been a pandemic uh, 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 such as we have uh, today uh, that may have caused the decline um, uh, of, of, the, of the civilization. Um, um, uh, those, those, those of you who uh, know the history of the new world, uh, who know uh, reasonably uh, are reasonably exposed to the history of what we, what is generally called the new world, which is South America, and which was where uh, uh, for a long period uh, we used to study about the Spanish conquest. Uh, now we know better uh, that there was no real conquest. Uh, uh, that uh, you know when 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 the Spanish people went there, when the Europeans went there. Uh, they took diseases with them that local people, uh, uh, the indigenous people at that time, had no resistance to, and there were mass deaths all over. So there could have been a pandemic, there could have been an epidemic. We don't know. Uh, 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 we know very little about uh, uh, about this uh, Aryan invasion or invasion of any kind. Uh, this Aryan invasion is what our generation uh, uh, was brought up on. We all studied this in school. I do not know if this Aryan invasion theory still exists in school textbooks or whether they have been revised, but this is the material that we were brought up on. But now I think it stands reasonably discredited that there, is no, there was never any such thing as Aryan invasion. Um, commerce and economy. Uh, some people say that you know, in, in the, the in, in Indus civilization was largely uh, uh, rooted in commerce. It, it was a mercantile civilization. It, it benefited enormously and profited enormously through its interaction with, with Mesopotamia, uh, with Sumeria, and, and, and its fortunes declined kind, kind of after trade fell, after trade collapsed, and so on and so forth. So that could be another reason. We don't know. Uh, um, there could have been a cultural implosion. There could have been a genuine uh, rebellion, an internal rebellion against against the central doctrine or the central rule or the centralized way of living, even though we don't know how centralized it was, whether it was really claustrophobic or not. We don't know. We don't know any of these things to be making large judgments about the Indus Valley civilization and about our history starting from that point onwards. Uh, anybody who says they know this for sure, then of course there are very many reasonable, reasonable hypotheses in each one of these bulleted items. If, if, if you talk about natural calamity, and if you dig into that literature of natural calamity, you can find many scholarly papers with plausible arguments for such a cause. And each one of them, each one in that list, you will find some evidence or the other. But 
it will not be enough to satisfy the whole collapse. It will not be satisfy enough to, to entirely justify the collapse of the civilization. And there are other questions to ask, and there are other questions that need to be answered before we can have any degree of understanding about some of the very basic things that we would like to understand about anything that we study, uh, in, such as you know, contemporary people anywhere in the state outside of, 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 of your state of dominion, uh, yeah, outside, uh, in, 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 let us say, in Karnataka, in Maharashtra, in Punjab, uh, there are a few things that we would like to know about people who are not ourselves, uh, 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 who are, uh, we, we would like, as t uh, I, I'm, I'm a Chennaiite, I'm, I'm a Tamilian, I was born and brought up in Tamil Nadu, uh, I, uh, and I have an approach for understanding people from outside Tamil Nadu in India, and we, we need an approach and we need to ask the right questions to understand other cultures and other people in our own country and all over the world and in times past, which we are talking about is 5,000 years ago, 4,500 to 5,000 years ago. So it is not easy to achieve that understanding and anything that claims to be unilateral in its approach uh, uh, claims to be a universal truth uh, um, uh, is less than likely to be true is the reason why we speak of what we do not know and less about what we do actually know. So it is all about the absence of evidence. And then there is also the evidence of absence. Uh, we know for a fact that when, when, we, speak, when we speak of the Indus Valley civilization, uh, it was not Indo-Aryan. The Aryan migration very clearly had not begun into India. Of course, the out of India theory is there, where we argue that all Aryans were actually born here and they went out of here, Aryan languages went from here. Uh, that is one theory, but if we talk of Aryan migration, we do not have any record of an Aryan migration before the time of Indus or until the end or the mature or the post mature decline phase of the Indus Valley civilization, not until about you know, 1500 BC. Until then, we do not really have clear evidence of Aryan migration into this country. And there is more and more research that is coming out, which is bearing evidence to this effect. Uh, and, 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 and therefore, there is no evidence for Aryan migration into this country or for Indus Valley to be understood or approached in Aryan terms or Aryan linguistic terms or Aryan racial terms or Aryan DNA terms, um, we don't have any evidence. And another evidence that we do not have very clearly that there is not a single horse bone excavated from any of the Indus Valley civilization sites of which there are nearly a thousand. Um, we will come, we'll come to the number of the cities, the extent of the cities later, but there are almost a thousand Indus Valley civilization cities. And in any of these thousand cities, we have not come across a horse bone from that period. Uh, no spoked wheel. Uh, we had disc wheels. Uh, the Indus Valley civilization, civilization throws up evidence after evidence after evidence of disc wheels, but there was not a spoked wheel. So, and the spoked wheel and the horse were integral to the Aryan culture, Aryan religion, Aryan language, Aryan rituals, and none of these were evident in Indus Valley civilization ever. Uh, so these are some of the absences, conspicuous absences of evidence that, 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 that people are still looking for, but we cannot find. So it is in this light that, that we would like to approach, uh, I would like to approach this topic. Uh, so that was the first element of, of the meme that you saw, that is uh, Indus Valley Civilization, the topic and the title, what we do know. Um, let me move over to the next. Um, Bhaskar, sir? Yes. I'm sorry, I just wanted to request you to speak a little closer to the mic uh, because your the volume started to get low. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So, and, and today when we speak about this topic uh, and it's... It's, it's, it's as cultural, as historical, as it is political. And uh, what we get to hear are claims, claims, and claims. But what we do know is uh, the Indus Valley civilization 
had bull the bull in one form of the other as shown on the picture as shown on the slide on the left was its most conspicuous symbol it was its most frequent symbol it was it is the most statistically prevalent symbol so we had a lot of bull wherever we looked in the indus valley civilization and as you can see on the right indus valley civilization had latrines it had toilets uh so you can now put the two and two together the bull and the toilet and count two uh, so that is what we get to hear today on this topic from everywhere from 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 uh the din of political arguments uh, that are going on in this country on this topic uh, which have effectively drowned out any sensible scholarship uh, uh, to have a voice and speak with any kind of authority or clarity um, so that is what we get to hear um, on, on this topic today uh, for, excuse me for that aside so let me move to the three images that you would have come across uh the first was the unicorn uh, and the second was the image of the script that that was featured on the memes that the center shared with you all over uh, uh, um social media and mail and the third is the city and what is common to all these three are they are discarded they are abandoned they are jinxed you never ever see the unicorn ever again after the decline of the indus valley civilization never in any culture in any indian art in any indian iconography in any temple mural in any form anywhere no way it's gone without a trace the unicorn is abandoned forever so what was it was it a stigma was it uh a uh, 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 distasteful in some way uh, uh um uh, so what was the reason for the complete abandonment of the unicorn uh and its visual representation in all subsequent cultures in india and we seem to be very unanimous about it we as indians are unanimous in our reject rejection and in our abandonment of unicorn as a symbol whether we are indo aryan speaking people or whether we are dravidian speaking or whether we are munda speaking whether we are dark skin light skin whether we are from the north or from the south or the east or the west the unicorn has no representation in indian culture other than a few postage stamps that the government of india bothered to release from now and then apart from that the unicorn is abandoned and it is absolutely shocking when we will see subsequently how much of the indus valley civilization and its original visual culture we actually have retained we will see that subsequently the same with the script the the script has been completely abandoned we don't find a trace of writing as we see them on the seals ceilings and tablets of 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 the indus valley civilization and they never make another appearance again and if they do make an appearance they make solo appearances very parsimonious appearances the indus valley itself is very parsimonious there is very very little material there uh, uh, um, uh, well, that's one of its uh, um, uh, fundamental problems uh, and then we find even few one symbol we will come across somewhere in 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 tamil nadu on on, on a silk or on a pot uh, 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 maximum we will see two uh, 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 and we really cannot say this was that and that was this uh by by we don't know what is the continuity we can only be reasonably certain that it is not continuous uh, uh so the script is totally abandoned uh, um and the cities were abandoned for more than a thousand years after the second urbanization started so the the common motive of the material that you received that we sent out ahead of today for people to see represented these three aspects of the indus valley civilization that remain almost permanently abandoned by all of us who want to take pride in our history who want to know our heritage 
who want to belong to a culture who would like certain aspects of our identity identity to be better understood and better investigated and so on and so forth but what we have over a period of time done is actually completely abandon things and what were the conditions that led to this abandon abandonment will be an ongoing topic um in these talks today and in the coming weeks um so what do we have after the unicorn so first of all was the unicorn a unicorn um uh the unicorn is seems to be some kind of a mythical beast of composite features made of various animals um and its greatest identity is the single horn that you see here okay um let me use the annotation features also okay so you see yeah you see the the, the single horn um from the bull's head and was it first of all a single horned animal that that was being represented there um which is a good question to ask because evidence from indus itself makes us ask that question you see the 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 Im imagery on the left and you see this very nearly the same animal with the same body having three heads and if we go from clockwise from left to right the head on the left has two horns the head in the middle has one and the head on the right has two and it seems to indicate to us that in the middle position when a viewer sees it the two horns of the animal merge into one and it is that snapshot that is actually being represented on the right and that snapshot subsequently gets codified and that snapshot becomes popular in the indus valley civilization and it is that particular snapshot that graphic language that is favored by a majority of 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 the people of the indus valley civilization regardless of the region that they come from uh, whether from harappa or whether from uh, uh, lothal or whether from rakigiri or wherever they come from they all share this common identity and we find it there and that's it after the indus valley no so we do not even know the so called unicorn that we are speaking about was a unicorn the unicorn again has a history prior to the indus valley civilization it is the unicorn is not a, a, an invention of of the indus valley civilization it has uh, a, a lot of evidence in in earlier european uh, 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 cultures uh, uh, but it became mature it became widely adopted it became the most popular icon of its time between 2600 and 1900 bc which is generally considered to be the high point of the indus valley civilization so we do not even know whether the unicorn was actually a unicorn we only know that there was a symbol called unicorn we don't know whether it was a real animal compare this with a a particular device that the unicorn stands in front of all the time in in most of of the symbols we see you see this you see this particular thing you see a shaft and you see an object at the top of the shaft and you see another object a bowl shaped object at the bottom and then you see dots all over it all around it beneath that bowl you see these dots or droplets and there is a drawing on the right which which is actually a reconstruction um of 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 that object and finally this object finds a mention in the rigveda this object is described in its exactitude part by part by part 1 to 11 parts in the rigveda and it is probably a filter that was used to extract some kind of a liquid and the droplets show that this liquid coming out of this filter and this sacred filter is be is alluded to in later times in the vedic times but the unicorn that stands in front of the sacred filter 
which be becomes a sacred filter standard is never spoken of again okay so even its adjacent objects are spoken of in the in 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 indian tradition in subsequent indian tradition but the unicorn becomes some kind of a taboo to speak of there is no reference at all to this um, we now go to next the swastika the swastika is 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 a pan religious symbol of india it is a common heritage of the hindus of the buddhists of the jains uh, and we take it directly from the indus valley civilization all three religions take it directly from the indus valley civilization it is not uh, a, a, a hindu heritage alone uh, all three major religions all three major faiths uh, to have emerged in the subcontinent subsequently uh, in south asia borrow the symbolism of the swastika from the indus valley which in turn actually borrows it from earlier cultures outside of india <clears throat> and that's that's another story altogether so the swastika is retained by by the subsequent indian culture but the unicorn is abandoned let us see the next one we we have sorry i am trying to undo that annotation one second yeah thank you Okay. Um, okay. So, so, so the the swastika continues uh, uh, right down to. I don't have to show modern day examples of swastika. We all know that. Uh, I assume we all know that. Uh, uh, so, so I'm not going down there. I'm merely showing samples, archaeological evidence from the Indus Valley civilization, and that is it. Um, if we take this chakra that we see here what seems like a disk um which we now do, know as dhamma chakra uh which we know as the symbol of ashoka which we also know as the symbol of modern india which we see on our flag which we see everywhere in subsequent indian history um it is borrowed it is directly inherited it's a common inheritance from the indus valley civilization but there is a side story here of enormous importance that i must stress on before we proceed uh, uh, further uh, this chakra was it a chakra really in indus times or it only became did it become a chakra only in later times it is important to understand that and for, and the chak this so called chakra the wheel uh, was one of the most enduring and one of the most ancient symbolisms of the indus valley civilization which also became a sign in the script that as you see here on the left um, and on the object on the right that you see is is actually an amulet found from mergar and it is the oldest object known to man that is produced using the lost wax method which is a technology that is in use even today and the famous chola bronzes and many other bronzes made in india fashioned in india in the subsequent times all use this lost wax technique to produce metal it is an important technique in metallurgy it is an important milestone in metallurgy and this technology the earliest evidence of this technology is comes to us from mergar and there is a lot of very interesting material about this mergar amulet uh, the size of it is 5 mm as 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 you, as you can see uh, it has been uh, subjected to a lot of spectroluminescence analysis uh, uh, by labs all over the world and spectroluminescence has revealed its composition and the potential possible technique of how it was made um but today there are many people who are, read this as evidence of the presence of a spoked wheel in indus valley civilization and therefore quick to extrapolate that 
the Vedic Aryans were already there as part of the Indian Indus Valley civilization. And therefore, all of the Indus Valley civilization spoke Sanskrit and it was Vedic Aryan. And it was this point of view that was echoed in parliament as part of the budget speech in 2020, when our honorable finance minister declared that the Indus script had been deciphered and people from that school the, the, the her source can be traced to a school that advances the theory that this is evidence of a spoked wheel that is this five millimeter amulet made of lost wax method in mergar which is a proto indus valley civilizational artifact okay which thereafter never shows any evidence of a spoked wheel but only of a disc wheel right until its decline. They twist this evidence and take that to be a spoked wheel and argue for the presence of the spoked wheel and therefore argue for the Indo-Aryan nature of the Indus Valley civilization and so on and so forth. And this is how, you know, the facts are interpreted. Uh, sometimes misinterpreted, sometimes over enthusiastically interpreted. Um, I am not really discussing politics here. Uh, I don't care whether it is left wing or right wing. Uh, for as long as there has been politics, there will be, there has been left wing and right wing. And for as long there has been, there is politics, there will be left wing and right wing, hopefully. And, and I hope that it will, all be in a democratic framework and will not lapse into an authoritarian framework. Democracies and republic have always had room for left and right, for liberal and conservative. And they both have a room, they both have their valid points of view and they have a way of balancing each other out over a period of time, almost like yin and yang. And that's not the argument here. The argument is given an artifact, okay, do you assess it in all its light before you come to conclusion, conclusions and advance one theory or the other? So, and if you are going to over enthusiastically advance some theory about the nature of a particular object, basing it on a particular object and hinging the whole thing, whole argument on the subject, then it needs to be questioned. It needs to be called to question. And scholarly opinion that has, that consistently has questioned it receives no voice in parliament, okay? But over-enthusiastic uh, research of the nature that I'm pointing out to today finds echo in parliament and finds the endorsement of our current politics today. And that is something that we all have to be conscious of, aware of, maybe sometimes even wary of. Um, Unicorn versus people leaf. This people leaf is a, a ubiquitous uh, 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 sign um, of India um, in every religion. Again, in Buddhism, in Jainism, in Hinduism, in pagan religions, in 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 in, in primitive religions, uh, 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 in ancestral worship, in 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 religions that we are not even organized and we do not even know them to be religions. Okay, everywhere the people leaf is sacred. Everywhere. It is the Bodhi tree. It is the tree of fertility. It is where women go and, 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 and leave cradles praying for uh, an offspring. Um, so so it, this tree and its leaf represents a lot of things uh, uh, to Indian culture. Okay, and we borrow it directly the symbolism directly from the Indus Valley civilization. Again, one other element we retain, but we discard the unicorn. I'm merely pointing out all these elements that we retain to ask that question, why was the unicorn discarded? Why was it abandoned? What is so taboo about it? What is it about the unicorn that is so jinxed? Um, and this we understand when we study the contrast of what has been retained from the, from, from the Indus Valley civilization. And we retain, so far we have seen, we have retained the chakra, we have retained 
the people leave we have retained uh uh, uh, uh many 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 uh, the 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 uh, the syrup syrup purview method of bronze production uh, 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 which we continue even today uh, which the world continues even even nasa still continues to use the technology for for whatever metallurgical uh, uh, production that they have to do uh, so yeah uh, so we retain many things but we seem to have targeted something and discarded it so we'll 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 see more about the paper leaf uh, uh, later column uh, um we f find a lot of evidence of it in 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 in, in or rangoli uh, evidence of it in 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 the indescript in various form we do not know uh, whether they used it on the threshold like like people do in south india today um um and, and wash the threshold uh, and make columns there we do not know that uh, we have no evidence of that but the beginnings of the patterns uh, the geometric patterns of column it all began in this way there are many other things that i am not even showing here but if you look at the continuity with with, with the indus valley uh, we have remarkable continuity in cultural artistic and graphic terms but we seem to have applied it selectively and that is something that that worth pursuing and decoding and that is something that there is relentlessly worth asking uh, even if we do not find the answer so that is another symbolism that that we retain uh you see uh it, in indian in, in one of the things about indian iconography is is this is its fascination for multiple heads and multiple arms uh it's it becomes very very popular um uh, we don't have evidence of multiple arms uh from the indus valley civilization that that happens later in indian iconography that is brought infused into indian iconography later this but multiple heads is a play that began in the indus valley civilization as the graphic artists were working on and the artisans were working on these on the production of these seals and tablets uh it seemed to be their way of capturing animated movements um as the bull goes this way and that they captured in three positions and represented um and that the fascination for this three headed representation of animals and humans never leaves indian iconography and you can see it in ajanta i have seen it in tirupudai marudur which is a 16th century uh, a, 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 a temple art uh, i have seen it in even later representations and this three headed depictions of animals and humans is a constant recurring theme in indian iconography and of course three headed humans for us are brahma um, shiva uh, trishiras uh vishwakarman uh, uh vishwarupa um and 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 a whole lot of things uh, uh three headed things and that originates the representation of the three headed or polycephalic uh, humans uh, um and its graphic expression uh, is found in the indus valley civilization and this is somewhat unique this graphic expression itself is unlike the swastika uh, which was borrowed from which which pre existed Uh, unlike the unicorn which kind of existed from other cultures elsewhere this representation of three headedness uh, is rare to find if not impossible to find uh, in cultures earlier than the indus valley civilization uh, and on that note i also want to concentrate and 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 digress briefly uh, to talk about the three headed seated yogi uh, who is referred to quote uncode polycephalic ethiphalic pashupati rudra and so on and so forth and and later called proto shiva um and all kinds of things uh, um all kinds of subsequent indian history and subsequent indian iconography has been taken wholesale and extrapolated back into time and all that excess baggage has been loaded onto this figure is that fair when i see it when i see this figure sitting there 
and if i am not an indian if i am not aware of brahma if i am not aware of vishnu if i am not aware of shiva or even if i am aware of all of them uh, of the trimurtis um, when i see this what do i see i see a man in a horned headdress and a horned headdress is a natural disguise of a hunter every hunter gatherer all over the world wears a horned headdress there is nothing unique about a horned headdress it is in every culture all over the world at one point in time or the other it is a hunter gatherer's disguise as he moves through the bushes to capture the animal that he needs to capture where he is trying to fool the animal into thinking it is another animal moving through the bushes it is a simple disguise of the hunter gatherer and for me the three headedness is simply a depiction of a hunter gatherer par excellence right he is aware of everything that's going on around him he has got eyes in all directions he is extremely aware of the animals the movement of the animals the nature of the jungle the nature of hunting he is an extremely alert individual and it is simply an aspect uh, a graphic representation of that aspect of the hunter gatherer par excellence that we are seeing he is surrounded by all the animals um, he is surrounded by the rhino he is surrounded by the elephant he is surrounded by the bull he is surrounded by the tiger uh, all the animals that he that he uh, alternately hunts befriends sometimes eats sometimes fights with sometimes domesticate domesticates and keeps with him it's a complex relationship uh, at that time when domestication of animals begin man's relationship with the animal becomes psychologically very very complex because on the one hand man has to protect those animals having domesticated them and on the other hand he has to betray those animals by slaughtering them and eating them and thereby and it is that guilt or it is at that intersection that much of the ritual of sacrifice is born and there is a lot of literature about it beginning with robert calasso if you are interested you can go and read about it but there is a certain complex relationship between a hunter as he becomes a domesticator of animals and thereafter the relationship that he that man has to get used to with animals changes dramatically and this steel is a representation of all those for me and it has no it 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 may have become shiva later it may have become brahma later it may have become vishnu later it may have become trimurti later but it is all become that later not at that time at that time what it was we don't know in the absence of that let us not go and go ahead and say that it was pashupati it was proto shiva it was rudra and let us not claim a contemporary religion into a place when we don't know what religion existed or even if a religion actually existed we have very little evidence for all that um, so that is something that i wanted to digress to and and come back to uh, uh, the unicorn so the unicorn is forever abandoned i think i have repeated it often enough um i'll go forward now i'll go to the script um the script is again abandoned and abandoned forever um now before we go to its abandoned abandonment and what happened later and so on and so forth let us take a brief survey of 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 the literary history of india beginning with the indus valley civilization there was writing in the indus valley civilization and then there was brahmi in the mauryan ashokan times and thereafter we have had literary continuity okay but a good time lapse of almost 1500 years is there between the decline of the indus valley civilization and the rise of the mauryan civilization when literacy comes back so for 1500 years nearly we completely abandon literacy we abandon writing we go back from literacy to orality we as indian indians of the time abandon literacy and go back to orality let me repeat that um having said that we, we will come back to this theme later uh, in much greater detail and depth 
having said that, let me also go back to the basics of. I'm I'm going on saying that you know we went from literacy to orality, but there are questions about whether the Indus script was a script at all, uh, and 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 it is a valid question. It needs to be listened to. It needs to be answered. Uh, so in in a in a famous paper, I think in 2004 or 2005, uh, uh, as a st statistical evidence. Uh, uh and computer analysis showed uh that the indus script was not a script at all um it was just a random represent representation of some kind of a purely pictorial language some pictorial expression and it did not encode any kind of a language whatsoever uh that paper has faced many refutations since then i'm not again getting into the specifics of that paper and its details right now that's reserved for Uh, session two and session three, uh, but it has seen many a refutation, uh, not only from archaeologists and linguists, also from mathematicians and and computer programmers and so on and so forth. Uh, so it has seen many a refutation. So we could, with reasonable safety, uh, take the view that it was a script after all, and it was not some kind of a random representation of something, and that in the civilization was a literate civilization after all it was not an illiterate civilization they knew writing just as many other coeval civilizations at that time in the world knew writing um what, what does it encode um does it encode uh, uh, indo aryan and the, and the sanskritic uh, 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 languages uh, or any of the prakrits uh, um, uh, uh, or any of the uh, languages uh, uh, um of the indo aryan family uh or does it encode uh the dravidian languages uh, uh, uh as they existed before they diverged into telugu and tamil and kannada and malayalam and, and 20 other languages all over the subcontinent uh do 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 the the in the script uh, encode a dravidian language uh, um so these are questions uh, that are constantly being asked uh these are not new questions and and and, and answers are still being sought um does it encode actually more than one language that's a possibility too um um uh, in, in which case what are the languages it, it 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 encodes so there are a whole lot of possibilities um of to as to uh, uh, the linguistic composition of what we see as in the script writing which does not make much sense to us which we only know was abandoned for reasons that we do not understand at all um together with the decline of the indus valley civilization now this again you will find it very shocking just like how we did not abandon swastika we did not abandon the people leave we did not abandon dhamma chakra uh, but we abandoned unicorn uh, you will find it pretty shocking that a civilization can actually abandon literacy uh let us compare it with cuneiform uh, writing cuneiform writing and indus writing and hieroglyphic writing and indus writing and ancient chinese writing and indus writing all of them are contemporary civilizations and they all began writing more or less together at the same time uh we can squabble over a few hundred years here and there uh, but they were all literate more or less at the same time they all became literate more or less at the same time uh, uh the Mes mesopotamia uh egypt ancient china and indus valley uh, all of them became literate at the same time uh and if you look at cuneiform uh cuneiform subsequently lasted 3000 years it encoded six other languages before it eventually died out it had a life span of 3 thousand years okay take hieroglyphics it had a life span of 3000 years the indus valley civilization and its writing had a life span of only 800 years in 800 years the literacy experiment came to a standstill in india we therefore had no way of actually encountering or producing copious material with that script as you see on this cuneiform artifact and on this hieroglyphic artifact which is actually the rosetta stone which are uh, helped 
in the decipherment of the hieroglyphics and the cuneiform de decipherment also was possible because we the 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 the, the archaeologists encountered bilingual trilingual or multilingual represent representations of the same content uh, using different scripts that were in contemporary usage at the time if 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 you actually take a, take the rosetta stone the rosetta stone is 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 ptolemaic period it is second century it's 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 as recent as about 2000 years ago it is not as old as the egyptian civilization but what you see here is you see egyptian writing that still exists along with ancient greek and coptic and it is a continuing tradition that existed along with other scripts for a very 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 long time okay the indus script was alpayush it died a premature death and some conditions led us the people to abandon that literacy and go back to orality and for me in fact that is actually the most vexatious question to ask about indian history what kind of a situation can lead to the abandonment of literacy L literacy as an idea once it takes root anywhere in the world does not go away you cannot wish it away there is no evidence from any of the other civilizations that we are seeing on the on the screen whether it is egyptian civilization or mesopotamian civilization or chinese civilization or any of the civilization once the idea of literacy has taken root it is there to stay it doesn't go away you may change the script you may change the language empires may fall civilizations may collapse but literacy as an idea persists okay but it is a quirk of fate that the indus script vanished forever until brahmi comes along and is introduced in a grand way by ashoka and we have secure evidence of writing only that goes only as recently uh, goes back only only to 3rd century bc in 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 bce in 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 ashokan times you can push it back 100 years and 150 years and say but from from coin evidence or other evidence but securely dated evidence is for literacy settled literacy in india is only the mauryan times and not earlier than that but today iraq and iran can say their literacy goes back all the way to 6000 years back egypt can say their literacy goes all the way back to 6000 years back the chinese people actually never abandoned pictographic writing so they still retain elements of old chinese into contemporary chinese writing okay and chinese writing never abandoned anything but our writing our literacy cannot be set to go back to more than the mauryan times the literacy that existed in indus time is a different kind of literacy and we know very little about it we are as illiterate illiterate about it as the indus people were literate about it okay so that is something it, it, for me personally it is it is indeed the most vexatious uh, question uh, and i've had many opportunities to discuss it with um, airavata mahadevan we will see those as we go along how are we doing on time not bad okay uh in the cities and after uh it is a common misconception that 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 you know uh when we think about uh, uh indus valley civilization we think about harappa and mohenjo daro uh, uh the more informed among amongst us uh, think about dolavira and lothal and rakigari and, and and other cities but there are 862 cities excavated in india alone in the post partition times and let me read that read that for you uh, i didn't want to stuff the slides here with a lot of content but let me read it from you um uh, uh, from from a book for you uh yes Uh, in the partition of british india in 1947 all the major sites of the indus civilization known as at that time became part of pakistan 
um, during the last four decades, uh, this book was written at that time, four decades, um, uh, due to constant efforts of the Indian archeologists, more than 862 early Harappan and late Harappan sites have been discovered in the Indian Union. Uh, in India, the area of distribution of Harappa settlements runs broadly from Manda in Jammu, Jammu and Kashmir in the north to Daimabad in Northern Godavari in Maharashtra, um, in the, in, that is in the south, from Desalpur, the district Kutch in Gujarat, uh, uh, to Hulas in the district of Saranpur in Uttar Pradesh. That was the extent of the Indus Valley civilization as we have discovered. Um, and there were nearly a thousand cities. And these thousand cities were abandoned. And these, and there was no urban life. Again, just like how there was no literacy for more than a thousand years, uh, there was no urban life for more than a thousand years after the decline of the Indus Valley civilization until the second urbanization happens in the East in Pataliputra. Um, and now in Tamil Nadu, we have evidence emerging that there is a second urbanization that began to emerge in Tamil Nadu in the South uh, in the form of Kiradi, though the dating is, is as yet unsecure. Uh, but urbanization had to wait, just like literacy had to wait another 1,000, 1,500 years after the decline of the Indus Valley civilization. Urbanization also had to wait another 1,000, 1,500 years before the re-emergence of cities and civilization as we know them today. Uh, so there was a, an abandoned, and, and all that we see is, are these iconic cities like Mohanjadaro, um, and, and, and Aharapa, we keep seeing these pictures over and over again, uh, and, and that's all we know, but that is not the truth. That is far from the truth. We have a thousand, and chances are any Indian who has traveled in the northwestern part of India, even casually, has gone past one site or the other without actually taking much notice of what he or she was going past. Uh, so it is that prevalent. Um, so the city is declined, uh, never to make an appearance for more than a thousand years after. Which now brings me actually to the, the, the uh, uh, last topic of the talk today, Aidavadam um, Nahadevan. Uh, it is in honor of him and with material that I learned over conversations with him uh, that I'm speaking today to all of you. Um, without him, I won't uh, have a reason to be here and talking on the subject. Um, <clears throat> he gives me the confidence. He gives me the knowledge to uh, speak about it. Despite which, of course, I'm likely to sound ignorant. And I wanted to remark that the ignorance is mine. The knowledge is his. Ignorance and ignorance alone is mine. Uh, so let's be clear. So on, on the uh, on the left, you see a picture of Airavad uh, um, Mahadevan, uh, taken by Omar Khan uh, uh, from Pakistan, uh, who runs this fascinating site called Harappa.com, which is full of fantastic material uh, curated about the Indus Valley civilization in a non-partisan uh, 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 manner. Uh, and more exciting, it has a lot of shopping. You can buy uh, Indus replicas, Indus artifacts, um, all kinds of things. Uh, Omar Khan took that picture of Airavadam Mahadevan in his house when he visited him when Airavadam was in his early 60s, I think. Uh, and that is his favorite picture. It is the picture that he always used to give to the press. He always would put it everywhere in his book, uh, in, even in his revised editions of book. And he did not actually want to use more recent pictures. And I have taken, I think, thousands of pictures of them. Um, but this was his favorite picture. And the one on the right is, is a picture of him taken exactly two years ago on his last birthday on October 2nd, 2018. Uh, November 2016, 2018, he passed away. Uh, um, and you can see um, to the rest of the Indians, it is Gandhi Jayanti today. And uh, to me, it is Airavadam Jayanti. And you can, but you can see in that picture, my selfie of our selfie. Um, uh, you can see Gandhi there. You can see the coin, uh, uh, Thiruvalluvar coin, uh, uh, coin 
and 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 vivekananda um, um, on the backdrop against him uh, i wrote an article soon after i got this passing which is on medium uh, those of you who are interested in the nature of uh, 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 my relationship with either of them uh, can go that uh, uh, it clarifies a lot of things i don't claim to be a scholar i claim to be some kind of a middleman i began as a dtp assistant to to uh, 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 to either of the maharevan i used to help he never used to touch a computer he used to call the mouse mushikam uh, and and he used to, uh, but he'll say if i touch the computer it will give me a shock so i we therefore we had a happy contract uh, uh, so he won't touch the computer he will say everything to me or he will write it down on bits and pieces of paper and give it to me and i will put it on the computer i will show him drafts we will revise we will repaginate we will reset we will send it to publication and over a period of time i became kind of reasonably good enough for me to ask him to go and represent him in lectures uh, when he couldn't travel himself to to speak his papers out in in conferences and gatherings and i have attended many such lectures uh, in delhi in hyderabad in pune uh, uh, everywhere where he couldn't be present himself he would prepare me he will give me all the material and he will go he say go and speak but do not answer questions take questions and bring them back to me for me to answer via email um, and but ev- eventually he recognized and and allowed me to be a co-author of more than one paper one of them is published and a few of them are unpublished and i'm working on all the material uh to publish them uh, and so uh, my relationship began with him not with indescript it began with brahmi uh in 2000 i have known him i had known airavata mahadevan for the last 12 years of his life uh from 2007 from early 2007 to late 2018 uh when he passed away uh it began with the tamil brahmi pro- project uh and he recommended me to the central institute of indian languages uh, uh um and for documenting all the known inscriptions all over tamil nadu at that time uh and he had published his early tamil epigraphy a book uh, which is considered the magnum opus of 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 tamil epigraphy uh in 2003 uh, as an a harvard oriented series and jointly published with kriya uh and that book had already become uh uh, 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 uh popular uh it entered the collective conscious of 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 uh, tamil people uh tamil people began to understand the script and the origins of literacy in tamil nadu like never before they were massively enthused and thereafter uh it, it was a watershed mo- the arrival of the book was a watershed moment in <clears throat> in a neo tamil literacy and cultural sensitivity because it made it possible for thousands and thousands of people to access ancient tamil material with ease um and this book represented that and and this book existed only as a book it was a mighty tome of 800 pages and it cannot even be easily lifted uh, um <clears throat> so airavatham was very very keen that an electronic corpus of the entire material should be produced and he put me in touch with the central institute of indian languages uh, uh to 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 make sure that this corpus can get produced and then we spent two years on the field uh capturing all the material from primary source and when we took that material from the field the digitized material from the field <clears throat> to the computer and when we came back to chennai after traveling through uh all the brahmi regions in tamil nadu primarily in near madurai and some near tirunelveli and and a little bit in kerala and so on and so forth when we came back and i showed him that material he saw something at that time which i saw in his eyes that might have been equal equal to him seeing a brahmi for the first time uh he was able to see it with greater clarity at greater magnification than ever ever before in his lifetime though he has touched every one of them in fact the very first time i met airavatham i remember uh i, I go to walk into his house the first question he asked me can you tell me why this finger is smaller than this finger that is a four finger i just put a blank smile and then he said that is because that is how much this finger has been run on rock inscription this finger is worn by the amount of searching it has done on rough 
rock surfaces. It has diminished with all that search. And so he has seen everything. He has touched everything. There is not a single inscription that he was not aware of. And, and even to him, it was a revelation to see the material that our team had digitized uh, in the field. And once I brought that back and he saw it, we started working on a book. And thereafter, my relationship with him became a, an everyday relationship, many calls, very nearly a visit on a daily basis. Occasionally, it'll become, but on an average, at least twice a week. And, and we would go, we will work. And on, on, on the revised edition of that book that was published in 2003, which was republished in 2014 with, with, with latest material that we captured in the field. Um, but around 2010, even as we were working on the revised edition of Brahmi, he became impatient. He started speaking to me more about in the script um, and, and, and about the unfinished work uh, in the, on the Indescript that he had. Now, uh, Airavata Maharevan goes back to Indescript and again, he goes back to 1970. That was the first 1970, late 1960s when he entered the field of Indus studies and started publishing papers in Indus studies. And due to many factors, including personal tragedies, um, uh, he turned away from the subject for a long time and then decided to return. And towards the later period of his life, he found the motivation to return the subject and search and bring from the crevices and the nooks of his memory um, and his brain all the material that he had worked on in his past in putting together the most significant corpus of in the science known in the 60s and published by the Archaeological Survey of India in 1977. Uh, that was the most authoritative uh, corpus of Indus inscriptions until uh, uh, the publication of uh, a, a more pictorial, uh, uh, but an altogether much more expensive corpus, uh, 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 which cannot be easily uh, uh, afforded by Indians because it costs, uh, a book costs, I think, about 17,000 rupees. And there are four volumes together, it'll cost in excess of 80,000 rupees, published by ASCO at the initiative of ASCO Parpola, um, which is a UNESCO funded book. Uh, in fact, it is here, I can show you. Um, this one, so three volume corpus. Um, uh, it's, it's now actually a four volume corpus. Uh, um, so there is a corpus done by Airavata Mahadevan. The world. And before that, there was a corpus of Hunter, uh, which is a much smaller corpus. Uh, and now the, the latest in the field is a corpus by Brian Wells. Uh, so while there is not much significant movement in our, movement in our understanding of the Indus script itself, uh, there is continuing advancement in how this material is organized, classified, taxonomized, and presented by generations of scholars. And there is assiduous and meticulous cataloging that happens you know, every 20 years, and we see evidence of it. And with that, new knowledge keeps coming out, new artifacts that come out from, from the Indus Valley and its adjacent areas. Uh, mm, Come, keep coming to light, and 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 so there. So those of you who want to follow this subject, it is it is essential and and it is good to follow the corpuses that come out on the subject rather than the opinions that come out on the subject. Uh, and these corpuses are fascinating. Uh, the the visual uh, quality uh, is stunning. Uh, um, Andrew Robinson, uh, who wrote a biography on Satyajitre and wrote uh, a, a many books uh, on, 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 on world scripts, on all the scripts of the world. Uh, also wrote about the Indus Valley civilization, but not specifically on the Indus script. Uh, but he mentions that it was the beauty of the craftsmanship of these miniature seals, which are like, you know, 1.25 centimeter by 1.25 centimeter square. Uh, you know, these, this material you see here, What do you think might be its size? It, it is this much. It's 1.25. What do you think is the size of the dancing girl 
of Mohenjo-daro, who we all are familiar with as imagery goes. But do we? Does anybody know the actual size of of the dancing girl of Mohenjo-daro? How about this much? A little over four and a half inches. That's the size of the dancing girl of Mohenjo-daro. The miniature craftsmanship of the Harappans of the Indus Valley civilization was extraordinary. And Andrew Robinson uh, cited that as a primary motivation for him to engage with Indus Valley civilization and write a book about that. Um, and I thought that was worth uh, mentioning as well. Uh, so uh, Ayurveda Mahadevan has left a large legacy. Uh, uh, um, uh, generations of Tamil scholars uh, uh, should be and will be I hope we'll be uh, 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 thankful to him uh, in, in two areas of epigraphy, uh, one Brahmi and the other the Indus script. And Brahmi for him was finished work and Indus script was unfinished work. Okay. Uh, there was much that he wanted to say uh, that he could not say in his lifetime. I could, uh, in, I could see the anguish uh, in him. I could see the frustration of uh, uh, not being able to say it uh, at the speed and with the efficiency that you would have liked to see, say it uh, in, in, his, in, in his own, own line, lifetime. He left behind a legacy of uh, eight notebooks like this. I think this is the eight of them, eight of the volume eight, um, um, in which he wrote densely about his life and his findings on the Indus. And he left it as a challenge saying that anybody who can read my handwriting can also decipher the Indus script. And eight such notebooks are there and that is part of his legacy. Uh, I'm pointing this out not to uh, 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 make a hagiographic account of this man, uh, um, uh, but there is a significant body of work of, of his which is uh, either um, not understood, um, underappreciated, or not altogether seen light of day. Uh, the most accessible, unfortunately, he never wrote a book on the subject of uh, uh, Indus script. He wrote over 60 papers, uh, scholarly papers in his lifetime. Uh, and these are dense papers, uh, not friendly for the lay people to read and understand. Uh, it very often demands uh, 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 demands knowledge of, of uh, uh, Tamil, old Tamil and Sanskrit. Um, one moment, please. Yeah, um, it demands a lot of uh, 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 knowledge about uh, uh, linguistics. It demands a lot of knowledge about archeology, span about history. Uh, and it is essentially written for the scholarly audience. He wrote over such 60 such papers. Uh, all of them can be found online at rmrl.in. Um, uh, maybe not all of them, a few may be missing there. Uh, 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 but some of them are scanned copies and not all of them are, are text searchable uh, uh, copies. Um, uh, um, so uh, the task of curating uh, a, a volume of collected papers that are completely text searchable, uh, he, Airavatam assigned it to me, and that is an unfinished task for me now. Uh, um, and I am working on those, and in, 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 in quick time, I hope to be able to bring it out. In fact, it is a task that he jointly assigned to me and Ramakrishnan of Kriya. I don't know if he's attending this talk today. Uh, um, Ramakrishnan of Kriya. Uh, if you are there, please say yes. Okay. Uh, so it is a task that he has left to us, and I'm working on uh, uh, the collect on, on, on publishing uh, a, a volume of the collected papers, which I believe will be available online uh, uh, very soon. Uh, I'm not able to uh, commit a firm date at the moment, but when I say very soon, it is actually soon, not uh, uh, years. I'm talking only months. Um, so th the notebook is another long legacy um, uh, that 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 he left behind, um, and in his own lifetime and. He wrote only one popular account. All of 24 pages, hidden gem. It's a beautiful summary of 
the present state of knowledge on the indus valley writing the indus script and that is what i have as a picture on the right interpreting the indus script the dravidian solution by ayravata mahadevan it was delivered as a convocation address um at the kupam dravidian university in 2015 uh anybody who may like to read a copy of this i would be happy to uh share this uh pdf uh, uh to anybody who sends me a mail requesting a copy uh, uh via the volunteers uh of the center uh this actually represents the most concise account of the present state of knowledge of the indus script as of 5 years ago when i was presented it at the convocation address at kupam university this is a marvelous little uh handbook um uh Uh, it is as valuable as the mighty tomes that anybody has produced on 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 the subject uh, it might be actually a very good idea uh, for those of you who plan to come for the subsequent sessions um, uh, of this talk series uh, to to visit that material um, before coming to the second and the others uh, as you may seem fit uh, that is fantastic material um, so i will be happy to uh, share it as we uh, go along um so with that what what were his concerns what i am wanted i am i am is 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 very anecdotal uh uh airavata mahadevan he used to say i am like 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 a tamilian with a tamil accent why i am i am what i am uh so that i am is a is a is a uh, is it is is more than an abbreviation it's uh, when i read that i hear the voice i hear the south indian accent i hear the um uh, tinge of uh, uh, cacophony uh, uh, sarcasm uh, everything attached to how he even pronounced uh, anyway uh, be that as it may in his last two years he was extremely concerned and he thought he was extremely close to identifying the adityas mentioned in vedic literature in the indus script he believed that the vedic aryans when they came in contact with the indus civilization though it was already declining there were many aspects of the indus valley civilization they came into contact with they understood it they observed it they chronicled it they reported it it's just that it's not done in a systematic way and he even believed that it, at least some aspects of the rigveda was an oral rosetta stone not a written material but it's a, an oral rosetta stone to decoding the indus script he believed <coughs> that vedic lit- literature contained many clues to understanding the indus script though in vedic literature in the symbolism was not just simply inherited and retained it was modified it was translated it was subsequently layered uh chakra for instance became from from its original meaning of whatever it was which we will see later to 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 dhamma chakra and kal chakra and so on and so forth uh so it acquired new meanings in vedic times and post vedic times um the three headed hunter became trimurti and trishiras and brahma and vishnu and, and and shiva and so on and so forth um but they are clues they do not belong they may not belong to the indus valley civilization the adityas did not belong to the indus valley civilization the adityas were uh, a, an aspect of the vedic civilization that the vedic civilization borrowed from the indus civilization in whatever way it borrowed and made native to its own self and airavatam believed that he was very close to identifying mitra varuna uh, uh, all the things that we hear in the sanno mitra samvaruna sanno bhavat paryama sanna indro bhaspati sanno vishnu rurukrama that is mitra varuna bhaspati urukrama uh, every one of those adityas uh, uh, he believed that he was very close to identifying those adityas in the indus script in their pre vedic form uh, and he he used uh, 
uh, uh, uh, the Vedic literature and the Puranic literature and much of later Indian numismatic history and epigraphic history and archaeological history of India, not only of the Indus time, but its subsequent times on the understanding that there was a lot of continuity and there is, of course, a lot of continuity as, as I have shown you, even sketchily as I have shown you with just swastika and with the people leave and with various, uh, you know that there is a lot of continuity uh, and there was continuity and there is much that we borrowed from the in the script and therefore in the script can be understood by evidences from parts of our history that followed the Indus Valley civilization, which were not coeval, but later history, much of our early history can also be understood from later history. And Vedic history is part of the later history uh, of India compared to the Indus Valley civilization. And through Vedic history, he believed that he had very nearly solved the puzzle of the Adityas. He also believed that he had solved the puzzle of Nala, the Nala that we all know, uh, the Nala who Vyasa mentions in the Mahabharata, in the in the in the Manaparman, when when Yudhishthira asks uh, uh, Vyasa, uh, "Do you know another man uh, who gambled away his life and lost everything to which the all-knowing Vyasa loves and starts then telling the story of Nala uh, in the in the in the Mahabharata as a story that happened long before the Mahabharata. Uh, uh, so he believed that Nala was an aspect of the Indus Valley civilization and Nala is represented in the Indus script everywhere. And he wrote them all down and never really published them. And he also was very, and, and I, I could easily today announce all these, but his own wish was that, that these are written as proper scholarly academic papers and submitted to peer reviewed publications rather than to be announced to uh, Facebook and, and media in, in general, as is the case that uh, uh, with, with, with much of modern scholarship, uh, nobody cares about peer review, nobody care, uh, uh, cares about, uh, uh, you know, you know, weighted opinions uh, uh, and, and so on and so forth. They, they blame the system and they say that system is not okay. Uh, and they have their own system of crowdsourcing an audience through through social media and so on and so forth. Uh, but he was very keen, he was an old school. He was very keen that whatever material that he worked on should go through tried and tested academic channels. And therefore it is not going to be an overnight enterprise for anybody who engages in that material to bring them out. And therefore, um, if I manage to plow through the dense pages here and come away and actually read his handwriting, and lucky enough, then I may also actually understand what he says and with some truth represent what he says. And that truth may in turn actually be the truth about the Indus Valley civilization for all we know. Uh, because I think in all the controversy, in all the din um, and in all the mighty tomes of knowledge that we have produced about the Indus Valley civilization, um, if there is a semblance of international consensus about the nature of the language that the Indus Valley civilization encoded, please mark my words, underline words like semblance, uh, consensus, scholarly consensus. Um, it is only about the Dravidian nature of the Indus script, not about the Indo-Aryan nature or the Munda or the Paramunda nature, or the multiple language hypothesis, but the early Dravidian or a proto-Dravidian uh, basis, uh, linguistic basis of the Indus script is what most international scholarship hesitantly nods its head to, not definitively, hesitantly. Uh, in private conversations, uh, many of these people have sounded much more confident, far more confident, uh, but announcements to that effect have been made, uh, claims of this, for instance, Airavatam himself uh, 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 has made claims of decipherment uh, in, in his early career with the Indus script, uh, but later on he was very careful to point out that in the absence of 
something like a bilingual inscription or a rosetta stone uh, a, a decipherment as we know it uh, um is not possible for the indescript and the indescript has to be interpreted one sign at a time and there are at least 395 non recurring signs each with its own variants that means we need 395 scholarly papers each one deciphering each and what i know and what i'm exposed to is that that airavada mahadevan was close to an explanation of 85 of these signs 85 85 of the 395 and these 85 constitute roughly 80% of the occurrences of the entire scenery in the Indus Valley Civilization and delving into those in some depth will be the object of uh, the, 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 the uh, next sessions in this. And I think with that, we reach the, in fact, I've overshot. Uh, we are supposed to set aside 20 minutes for question and answers, if any. Uh, so if Aishwarya and Abhijit, if you are there and if you want to pass on those questions to me, uh, it would yeah. be an appropriate time to, to do that, I think. Yes, thank you, sir. Um, after this very interesting talk on the Indus Valley Civilization, I would also like to invite more participants to write in your questions as well as your feedback in the YouTube chat or the Zoom chat. Bhaskar, sir, the first question uh, that was sent is, is Sanskrit the mother of all Dravidian languages or is it a coded form of a mother language? Which is the mother of all languages? Is there, is, uh, there is a very simple answer. There is no such thing as a mother of all languages. Okay. <laughs> there is no such thing as a mother of all languages. If you want to understand anything in those terms, that means you have a predisposition for a monolithic answer. Right, right. And monolithic answers should actually not be asked even. Monolithic answers are against the scientific temperament. We have to ask questions that are more plausible. Uh, questions that are likely to yield answers rather than likely to yield beliefs. So to ask the question, which is the mother of all languages, it is a wrong question. There is no such thing as a mother of all languages. Can we move on to the next question? Unless, uh, um, I, I don't know who asked this question, unless that person wants to ask a consequential question on this, we can move on to the next. All right. Uh, the next one is, is, is is that Kelladi or older than Sanskrit or both were in the same period? Kelladi is uh, apparently the, the, the archaeological reports, I have seen the archaeological reports, they are able to take it up to the 6th century BC in terms of uh, its time period is, 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 is what the archaeological reports say. And the 6th century BC means it would be roughly equal to uh, the uh, pre-Mauryan Nanda uh, dynasty times, uh, early uh, uh, times of the second urbanization of India, uh, uh, and it would be coeval with Paninian times. It could be a, it would be a time where Sanskrit was well encoded, and and the, all the prakrits were in use, uh, uh, and Dravidian languages were also in use. Uh, uh, so Kiradi uh, was a, a contemporary culture uh, in the Dravidian heartland. Uh, uh, as uh, in, in an area that we understand as Dravidian heartland today, uh, um, from uh, the period of the second of the emergence of the second urbanization of India uh, around the sixth century BCE, uh, as the archaeological reports uh, 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 um, like to inform. Um, okay, thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, the next question. 
is uh, why is there extra ex uh, representation which some say is a tough or an incense stand or as you have described only with the humpless bull and not along with the humped bull why is there this extra representation extra representation of what the i think the filter that you described I brought the incense stand. That um, this is the question is from someone called Daisy Narayan. Yeah. So she is she's asked why is there this extra representation? Do you extra representation of what? To the incense stand that uh, is all almost always shown only with the humpless bull. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So she's asking why the, the, is there? The, 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 there, are, there are fascinating accounts of these. Uh, 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 there is a there is something called the unicorn trilogy. uh i have the mother even wrote three papers about this uh, and there is also a lot of other material uh, uh, about the unicorn and about the about the sacred filter standard about uh, the various theories about that object and its representation uh, these uh, the sacred Fal filter standard is as proposed by ayurveda the mahadevan and it is slowly beginning to gain some scholarly consensus i will provide citations for that scholarly consensus consensus in the second topic but yeah why why it is always facing this Uh, uh um and what is the significance what is the interrelationship between this object and the unicorn will be uh, a subject of deep dive uh, uh in the subsequent sessions okay uh there's no more questions uh remaining there's just a request from someone to put out the name of the book on indus valley cities in india so uh this came on youtube live so request to put out the name of the book on indus valley cities in india oh there are plenty of maps uh, and there are plenty of uh, uh, books already available uh, so if people are interested i could compile a short bibliography of essential reading and uh, give it to you volunteers to uh, uh, to put it up on youtube and ask people to go to those uh, 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 and access that bibliography and read it at their own time all right that's all that's it from the comments that we've gotten uh, so before i close uh, before i say closing remarks would you like to still wrap it wrap the talk up or uh, that give, give suresh may, suresh may like to do that suresh also if if you would like to then would you like to give them an idea of what they can look forward to in the next four lectures in this deeper exploration of indus valley civilization yes we 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 will we will largely uh, our our bias uh, will be on on the aspects of writing uh, uh, and and uh, literacy uh, um, uh, and the uh, languages uh, uh, language or languages that the script encoded uh, the methodologies uh, that have been used by scholarship uh, not only ayurveda the mahadevan but a comparative methodologies of all the all the uh, uh, scholarship Uh, uh, available on this material, we will we will survey those uh, uh, um, uh, in in the in the upcoming uh, um, talk, and I will be and I think every we uh, every talk is on Friday, and we plan to publish uh, um, something like a small abstract or a table of contents of an upcoming talk, uh, uh, the Wednesday ahead of that talk, for people to 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 look at yeah. uh, and prepare. even questions ahead of the talk if they want to prepare questions yes all right thank you sir um so rish sir would you like to say something before i close the session so rish sir you are on mute i have i have deliberately avoided um uh scholarly citations uh, uh uh multilingual terms uh tamil and sanskrit and all those things uh uh, uh, uh that this subject demands uh, 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 uh liberal use of uh, um, uh for this topic and kept it at at at, at a very basic general level uh uh, uh 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 not that i underestimate the audience or anything like that but i certainly want to keep it as easy Uh, and as accessible as the material can be uh, before we start deep diving where it does become difficult it becomes dense uh, uh, it it becomes far more argumentative uh, uh, and far more uh, 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 even controversial uh, um, uh, so all that 
uh, maybe uh, it, it, it's it's kind of aud- aud- audacious for us to also announce a five part lecture on a topic like this uh, i i hope that uh, you know there'll be continued audience interest uh, 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 but but uh, it's all right i mean we, we are not ex- 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 expecting virality here mm-hmm. uh, we would be perfectly happy to have 10 people uh, stick around uh, till the end uh, and mm-hmm. that would be absolutely gratifying and wonderful to uh, have in itself uh, um, but yeah a larger participation is always very gladdening uh, especially in this matter which is consumed uh, by our facebook and and, and and twitter and 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 through uh, and from sources who are not who are less than equipped to even broadcast that material uh, to uh, dubious false propaganda uh, channels uh, and pick up bites from here and there and then think something about that and form your opinions based on that is is not a great idea at all no and that is that is actually the 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 object of this mm, um if 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 iravatham mahadevan had been around and if i had asked him should i talk about this subject he would have laughed uh, in 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 a manner uh, and he has that one type of laugh uh, uh, which tells me uh, uh, and, and I, i immediately process that laughter and say this is doomed to failure right at, right from the word go yes that kind of a laugh uh, so if you want to take it to the common people and try to build consensus on a subject like this be my guest good luck to you uh, uh, is, is what would have been his uh, thing therefore he always continued to engage with the scholarly audience uh, and 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 uh, um, and avoided the din of uh, uh, i mean though he was a newsman himself he was the editor of dinamani uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, if he had wanted to go to news he would have known uh, he could have gone uh, he but that was not his predisposition um, he wanted to put the topic through scholarly opinion um, uh, uh, and 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 gain the weight of it uh, it didn't matter uh, whether, whether there was agreement or disagreement uh, but it is essential that there is a discussion it is essential that there is plural opinion uh, uh, it is essential that research is ongoing it's an important topic uh, just because there is no rosetta stone should we give up investigating the indescript until such time rosetta stone is discovered somewhere from sumeria uh, from mesopotamia no uh, the research it is like asking uh, until such time a road is paved to everest should we stop conquering it uh, should we stop climbing it uh, so research must be ongoing with whatever little material we have we should take make the best use of that material and try to get at something and it was in that spirit of knowledge that he always pursued that research and it is in that spirit that i am sharing the material that i am exposed to uh, in my 12 years of my relationship with him thank you all for everybody who is here and everybody who would like to be here again and other people who might like to join and thanks uh, friends uh, uh, suresh abhijit and aishwarya who like you know worked as much as i have in in, in or probably even more in in, in putting this together um, Uh, and that's it for today we finish 5 minutes early unless you want to add something to it suresh yeah uh, thanks uh, baskar you have negotiated uh, many traps in this large issue of indus valley civilization which are problematic issues today and a number of people have uh, commented uh, on on that that they would like to raise some of these issues i say i've told them to write back uh, in the email so that we can collate it together uh, the general response has been very good and the whole thing of what you do not know uh, baskar seems to have uh, struck home with many people because many things that you talked about for example about rosetta stone uh, or about the keledi uh, excavation that is currently ongoing now in tamil nadu which is very new so people from north india have not heard about it uh, or the various other thing for example the dancing girl of mohanjadaro you know uh, Uh, in fact i have been sending in as and when you talked about it uh, uh, references to that to people so that it's been circulated a request has come in saying that if you can compile a list of essential readings which are easily available so people yes. can come next time a little better prepared uh, yes. because it came in completely new uh, not what really uh, because there's no child in school going age in india who has not heard about indus valley civilization or read something about it and that's where our knowledge ends after that it's a lot of hagiography depending on political disposition or whatever we have come across 
so many people have written to me messages saying can you that's a, a fantastic point uh, because the script remains undeciphered uh, the indus valley civilization is largely consigned to uh, mystery uh, and uh, other aspects of it are also thought to be inaccessible which is not true uh, it's it's art and architecture uh, it's 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 technology and 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 its other aspects of life are very much accessible uh, even if you don't know anything about it even if you don't have any aspirations to any kind of scholarship you can enjoy the sheer beauty of it uh, 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 there is an aesthetic uh, uh, in, in 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 the indus valley civilization that goes far beyond our our uh, beyond transactional engagement uh, uh, with knowledge such as we uh, are busy pursuing uh, throughout our lives uh, there is a non transactional relationship uh, that we can have uh, uh, with the with the artifacts of that civilization uh, with its sheer compelling beauty uh, with the sheer wonder of, of of the technology that that the people of that time were able to produce uh, there are very many aspects that should be appreciated uh, like like the, like the lost lost wax method and all of us tamilians especially we'll be blind to something like this we think the chola bronze is the ultimate and everything is the chola bronze and the lost wax method stops with that no it goes right back and lost wax method is used by everybody all over the world uh, it goes right back to mehrgarh uh, uh, but but our own uh, uh, things will stop with chola pride uh, uh, medieval chola pride uh, so we we all get stuck to uh things that we are already familiar with familiar to that's a human tendency uh, a lot of people do not do this by design uh, but this tendency is easily exploitable uh, uh, uh this tendency can actually be converted into a gullibility uh, um and that is the caution which is why what we do not know uh which is why that is central and that is important in fact i wanted to say one more point about what we do not know we have one minute left uh it it is the, the title is also inspired by a book by two books uh, that i have come across in my life one a 1977 book called the encyclopedia of ignorance uh it was a very intriguing title so so i uh and 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 the uh, topic of that was basically the the editor of that book uh, got together the leading scientists of the world at that time and asked them to write about what is it that they do not know what is it that they would like to know what is it that they are likely to know in the within their lifetime and what is it that may remain in the realm of the unknown forever that was the encyclopedia of ignorance 1977 book i still have a copy uh, and and this is not a one off uh, every 20 years or so i notice that science like takes stock of what it does not know uh in 1994 or 1993 i think the retiring editor of uh, nature at the time john maddox uh wrote a book uh very much like the encyclopedia of ignorance uh, except it was titled what remains to be discovered again the broad theme was it was a summary of what is it that science does not know at that time and what are the urgent tasks that science has for the next 10 years what uh, 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 it, it is a, it is it is a survey of science as it stands at that particular time and it is a little bit of a uh, a, a gaze into the potential that lies ahead in the in the foreseeable future and it is also a gaze into the unknown and this combination this packaging this form of approaching approaching knowledge um has always been uh, fascinating to me and that is another reason why uh, i chose the topic the way um i chose it okay okay yeah uh, so the, the basic request uh, is that if you can like for example your encyclopedia of ignorance uh, is fascinating so if you can put together a small list of books a uh, list of uh, uh, published articles which are easily available for people uh, i think it might help and shouldn't wait for 3 days before the talk but perhaps by early next week so they can those of them who are interested would uh, like to read them and get a little acquainted with the subject Is yeah that... i could i could do it much uh, 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 earlier of course um uh, we'll have to discuss offline how you want to disseminate that yes we'll do that yes we can do that uh, so i i thank everybody i uh, and it's it's been a fascinating talk
and really looking forward to the next few talks. Uh, over to you, Ashwarya. Thank you, sir. Um, so the next talk will be on October 16th. Uh, we hope to see you all there and continue this exploration. If there are any questions that could not be addressed today, or if you're watching this video after the live session ended, uh, please mail the questions to kudam.center at gmail.com or leave a comment on this video and we're keeping an eye out so um, we can bring it back into the spotlight in the next talk on 16th October. Maybe on chat here, you can have my email as well. People who wish to write to me, they can write, they can write to me. Uh, um, Sorry, sir, I didn't hear that. Um, I, I, I said you can you can put my email on the chat and people who wish to write to me can write to me as well. Sure, sure. I'll give them that too. Yes, sir. Sure. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the, the, the coming weekend and, and uh, the, the whatever is left of your evening today. Thank you. All. <laughs> Bye.